everyone! I'm Miss Mary Beth, and I'm the Youth Services Librarian here at Ingalls Memorial Library in Ringe. And I'm here at the library, but not everybody gets to be. We're all being safe and healthy in our houses, which is very important. But it also makes me sad that I don't get to see you guys at the library. So, because of that, and because I love to share stories, I thought every day that I'll read a couple of chapters from a book. And together, we'll read a whole book, however long it takes. So for our first book that I picked, I chose the book The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. And I picked this book because every, hopefully everybody knows it, and it's a good story, and hopefully a lot of people will like this story. And I read it when I was a kid, and I really liked it. So I'm looking forward to reading it again. And this book was published in the year 1900, which is pretty old. It's 120 years old. And I like this because the author, L. Frank Baum, wrote, this book is dedicated to my good friend and comrade, my wife. And I think that's very nice. And the first chapter of this book is called The Cyclone. Do you know what a cyclone is? It's a big tornado. And they happen a lot in the Midwest where it's very flat. And that's where our story starts. Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four walls, a floor, and a roof, which made one room. And this room contained a rusty-looking cooking stove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the beds. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner, and Dorothy had a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all, and no cellar, except a small hole dug in the ground called a cyclone cellar, where the family could go in case those great whirlwinds arose, mighty enough to crush any building in its path. The cellar was reached by a trap door in the middle of the floor, from which a ladder led down into the small, dark hole. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the great gray prairie on every side. Not a tree nor house broke the broad sweep of flat country that reached the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the plowed land into a gray mass, with little cracks running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same gray color to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, but the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away, and now the house was as dull and as gray as everything else. When Aunt Em came to live there, she was a young, pretty wife. The sun and wind had changed her, too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober gray. The sun and wind had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and those were gray also. She was thin and gaunt, and she never smiled now. When Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her, Aunt Em had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. That makes me really sad. I hope you all can find something fun to laugh at today. Uncle Henry never laughed either. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was gray also, from his long beard to his rough boots, and he looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as gray as her other surroundings. Toto was not gray. He was a little black dog with long silky hair and small black eyes that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long and Dorothy played with him and loved him dearly. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky, too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes. From the far north, they heard the low wail of the wind, and Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. There were, now came a sharp whistling from the air in the south, and as they turned their eyes that way, they saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. <gasps> what do you think is coming? Suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming, Em. He called to his wife, I'll go look after the stock. Then he ran towards the shed where the cows and horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger at hand. 
Quick, Dorothy, she screamed. Run for the cellar. <gasps> Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed. And Dorothy started to go get him. Aunt Em, badly frightened, threw open the trap door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small, dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. But when she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind, and the house shook so hard that Dorothy lost her footing and sat down suddenly upon the floor. A strange thing then happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood, and it made it, the house the exact center of the cyclone. In the middle of the cyclone, the air is generally still, but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it up higher and higher, and there it remained until it was carried miles and miles away as easily as you could carry a feather. <gasps> Where is she going? It was very dark, and the wind howled horribly around her, but Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few whirls around, and one other time when the house tipped badly, Dorothy felt as if she were being rocked gently, like a baby in a cradle. Toto did not like it. He ran around the room, now here, now there, barking loudly. But Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Once Toto got too near the open trap door and fell in, and at first the little girl thought she had lost him. But soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole, for the st strong pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. Dorothy crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear, and dragged him into the room again. Afterwards, closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. Whoosh. Hour after hour passed away, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright. But she felt quite lonely, and the wind shrieked so loudly all around her that she nearly became deaf. At first she wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and she resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last she crawled over to the swaying, the swaying floor to her bed and she lay down upon it, and Toto followed and lay down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy soon closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. Hmm. That's the end of chapter one. Do you think you would fall asleep if you were in a flying house? I don't know what I would do. Let's see what happens next. Chapter two is called The Council with the Munchkins. Hmm. Dorothy was awakened by a shock so sudden and severe that if Dorothy had not been lying on the soft bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, the jar made her catch her breath and wonder what had happened. And Toto put his cold little nose to her face and whined dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark, for the bright sunshine came in at the window, flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed with Toto at her heels, and they ran to the open door. The little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked around her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sight she saw. <gasps> the cyclone had set the house down very gently for a cyclone in the midst of a country of marvelous beauty. There were lovely patches of green all around with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees and the bushes. A little way off was a small brook rushing and sparkling along between green banks and murmuring in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry gray prairies. While well, she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights, Dorothy noticed coming towards her a group of the queerest people she had ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folk she'd always been used to, but neither were they very small. In fact, they seemed about as tall as Dorothy, who was a well-grown child for her age, although they were, so far as looks go, many years older. So they were about as tall as Dorothy, but looked older than she did. Hmm. Three were men and one was a woman, and all were oddly dressed. They wore round hats that rose to a small point a foot above their heads, with little bells around the brims that tinkled sweetly as they moved. The hats of the men were blue. The little woman's hat was white, and she wore a white gown that hung in pleats from her shoulders. Over it were sprinkled with little stars that glistened in the sun like diamonds. The men were dressed in blue, of the same shade as their hats, and they wore well-polished boots with a deep roll of blue at the tops. 
The men, Dorothy thought, were about as old as Uncle Henry, for two of them had beards. The little woman was doubtless much older. Her face was covered with wrinkles, her hair was nearly white, and she walked rather stiffly. When these people drew near the house, where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among themselves, as if afraid to come closer. But the little old woman walked up to Dorothy, made a low bow, and said, in a sweet voice, You are welcome, most noble sorceress, to the land of the munchkins. We are so grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the east, and for setting our people free from bondage. Huh. Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. What could this little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress, and saying she had killed the wicked witch of the east? Dorothy was an innocent, harmless little girl who had been carried by a cyclone many miles from home, and she had never killed anything in all her life. But the little woman evidently expected her to answer, so Dorothy said, with hesitation, You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did, anyway, replied the little old woman with a laugh, and that is the same thing. See? She continued, pointing to the corner of the house. Here are her two shoes, still sticking out from under a block of wood. Here's a picture. There are the shoes. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. <gasps> there, indeed, just under the corner of the great beam the house rested on, two feet were sticking out, shod in silver shoes with pointed toes. Oh, dear! Oh, dear! cried Dorothy, clasping her hands together in dismay. The house must have fallen on her. <gasps> Whatever shall we do? There's nothing to be done, said the little woman calmly. But who was she? asked Dorothy. She was the Wicked Witch of the East, as I said, answered the little woman. She has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years, making them a slave for her night and day. Now all the munchkins are free, and we are grateful to you for the favor. But who are the munchkins? inquired Dorothy. They are the people who live in this land of the east, where the wicked witch ruled. Are you a munchkin? asked Dorothy. No, but I am their friend, although I live in the land in the north. When they saw the witch of the east was dead, the munchkin sent a swift messenger to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh, gracious, cried Dorothy. Are you a real witch? Yes, indeed, answered the little woman. But I am a good witch and the people love me. I am not as powerful as the wicked witch who ruled here, or I should have set the people free myself. But I thought all witches were wicked, said Dorothy, who was half frightened at facing a real witch. Would you be afraid? I would be. Oh no, that is a great mistake. There were only four witches in the land of Oz, and two of them, who live in the north and the south, are good witches. I know this is true, for I am one of them myself and I cannot be mistaken. Those who dwelt in the east and the west were, indeed, wicked witches. But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the west. But, said Dorothy, after a moment's thought, Aunt Em has told me that witches were, are all, were all dead years and years ago. Who is Aunt Em? inquired the little old woman. She is my aunt who lives in Kansas, where I came from, said Dorothy. The Witch of the North seemed to think for a time, with her head bowed and her eyes upon the ground. Then she looked up and said, I do not know where Kansas is, for I have never heard that country mentioned before. But tell me, is it a civilized country? Oh yes, it is, replied Dorothy. Then that accounts for it. In the civilized countries I believe that there are no witches left, nor wizards, nor sorceresses, nor magicians. But, you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized, for we are cut off from all the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards among us. Who are the wizards? asked Dorothy. Oz himself is the great wizard, answered the witch, sinking her voice to a whisper. He is more powerful than all the rest of us together. He lives in the city of emeralds. Dorothy was going to ask another question, but just then the munchkins, who had been standing silently by, gave a loud shout and pointed to the corner of the house where the wicked witch had been lying. What is it? asked the little old woman, and looked, and she began to laugh. The feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely, and nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old, explained the witch of the north, 
that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end of her. But the silver shoes are yours, and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes, and after shaking the dust out of them, she handed the shoes to Dorothy. The Witch of the East was proud of those silver shoes, said one of the munchkins, and there is some charm connected with them, but what the charm is we will never know. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on the table. Then she came out again to the munchkins and said, I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they will worry about me. Can you help me find my way back? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another. Then they looked at Dorothy. Then they shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, said one, there is a great desert, and none could live to cross it. It is the same as at the south, said another, for I have been there and I have seen it. The south is the country of the quadlings. I am told, said the third man, that it is, a, it is the same at the west. And that country, where the Winkies live, is ruled by the wicked witch of the west, who would make you her slave if you passed her way. The north is my home, said the old lady, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land of Oz. I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose while she counted one, two, three, in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate, on which was written in big white chalk marks. It said, Let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The little old woman shook the slate from her nose, and having read the words on it, she asked, Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child, looking up and drying her tears. Then you must go to the city of emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is this city? asked Dorothy. It is exactly in the center of the country, and it is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the girl anxiously. He is a good wizard. Whether he is a man or not, I cannot tell, for I have never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and sometimes terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? pleaded the girl, who had begun to look upon the old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied, but I will give you my kiss, and no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead. Where her lips touched the girl, they left a round, shining mark, as Dorothy found out soon after. The road to the city of emeralds is paved with yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. The three munchkins bowed low to her and wished her a pleasant journey, after which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times, and straight away disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone because he had been afraid even to growl while she stood by. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, and expected her to disappear in just that way, and she was not surprised in the least. And that is the end of chapter two. And that's where we'll stop for today. Are you liking it so far? It's a little different than the movie if you've seen the movie. So I'm interested to see how it goes on and what changes happen. So tomorrow at three o'clock, I'll see you again to read chapter three. Thanks for listening.